Now, from Wish TV, your local news source, this is All Indiana Politics. Good Sunday morning. Welcome to another edition of All Indiana Politics. I'm Phil Sanchez. An Indiana lawyer who worked in the Reagan White House has endorsed Kamala Harris for president. Peter Rustovin was an associate counsel to President Ronald Reagan. He's one of a dozen former Republican White House lawyers backing Harris. He sat down with our government reporter Garrett Burquist to explain why. Joining us now is former White House associate counsel Peter Rustovin. Peter, thank you for coming in today. My pleasure. Thank you. So you're one of a dozen former White House lawyers who worked in Republican administrations and have endorsed Kamala Harris for president. What led you to that? I think that uh, one of the things you learn working in the White House and one of the things I think Americans just learn is that a character is far more important than uh, where you stand on any tax issue, any economic issue. Um, and in this case, I agree with uh, candidly a number of former uh, Donald Trump cabinet officers as well as his vice president that he's manifestly unfit for office and therefore should not uh, again should not again hold that office uh, you know one of the things that distinguishes us a lot distinguishes us distinguishes this country from uh, other parts of the world but one thing until 2020 we could claim was we always had the peaceful transfer of power. Uh, and any president who tries to fight the peaceful transfer of power, who incites others to, to end up storming the Capitol, uh, I'm sorry, the Capitol, um, and in, in an incident where uh, five people lost their lives, uh, to my mind, should never again uh, hold the office of president of the United States. How did this group endorsement come about? Oh, I think many of us know each other and have talked about it and, and share the same views, you know, not identically on every issue, but we're all pretty much conservatives. That's why we worked in those administrations. If you want to talk tax policy or uh, size and what the size and scope of government should be, you know, that's why uh, I've been for Reagan since, uh, since, since I've been for Reagan since he gave a speech in 1964 for Barry Goldwater when I was uh, not even in my teens. But we share those views, but the other view we share is the one I, I, I just tried to articulate, which is a deep love for the country, a recognition that whatever our differences with those in another party or on a particular policy issue, uh, we share a commitment to fundamental rules of decency, the rule of law, and democracy. And in talking about it, I just decided, you know, at some point you take a stand. Um, and uh, whether whether our stand is particularly important or not, if it, if it affects anybody to know the people who worked for Ronald Reagan, people who worked for George H.W. Bush, people who worked for George W. Bush, who have profoundly conservative political views, believe that it's far, far more important that the person we elect as president be someone who will accept the results of elections and someone who will not uh, attempt to overthrow them um, and that we get back to what we used to be as a country and candidly what we used to be as a Republican Party. In trying to keep Donald Trump out of the Oval Office though, why endorse someone whose track record and whose policy proposals are frankly at cross purposes with the ideals of pre-Trump conservatism? What's more important? That's what it comes down to. What's more important for what we are as a people um, and, and where we move on from here? One of these two individuals is going to be president of the United States come January of 2025. It is, you know, to use the term, it's a binary choice. It's him or it's her. Which of them do you believe is better for the country? Is either of them disqualified by reasons of character and integrity? I mean, the answer for her, she's not disqualified by reasons of character and integrity. She is a, a center left and maybe, maybe even uh, leans a little more left than she does center. But she's going to accept the results of the election. She is not going to do something fundamentally irresponsible in terms of the core values of the country, which have to do with respecting opponents, respecting the results of elections. You know, and candidly, if you listen to her campaign, uh, she's not the one who was doing things like calling names uh, or, you know, I mean, good heavens, let's, let's, let's just talk about how we want our children to behave. 
you have a former president candidate for president who says things like, I'm better looking than she is. I, I, seriously? This is how you talk if you want to be president of the United States? Uh, you have, if you, if you read the things he posts uh, on, on Twitter, now X, uh, if you read the things he says in speeches, uh, he, he will say in the course of weeks things that in, throughout our history would have disqualified anyone else from serving in the office. Uh, I recognize that people have very strong feelings about this, and that's fine. And I think we should respect people whose, whose views differ from our own. But at some level, we have to have a consensus about the sort of baseline, character, integrity, trustworthiness of the person who holds that office. And if anyone has demonstrated candidly that he is about himself, I'm not even sure on the issues that we <coughs> describe as differences between Republicans and Democrats, it's not clear to me that he, he really has any deep personal convictions. He has been all over the, the lot, for example, on an issue about which I care, which is, which is a protection of unborn life, you know, and he's now moving away from that yet again. Uh, I don't think anyone can candidly look at him and deny what they see. But why support someone like Kamala Harris, who, as I mentioned earlier, is at essentially philosophical cross purposes with traditional conservatism instead of a different candidate, such as, say, the libertarian candidate, Chase Oliver. Uh, the libertarian candidate you just mentioned is uh, known to a fraction of the people who live in the United States of America. He is not going to be the next president of the United States. I, I mean, you face up to the, in, in, in life, you, you face up to the choices that are in front of you. Those of us with children know that, you, know, you, you you will, you will hear someone say, well, why is this so, why can't it be this? And, you know, and the response, I hope as a responsible parent, is because that's not your choice. It is going to be A or B. You have the responsibility to choose. You have the responsibility to make that choice in a responsible way. One of these two people is going to be president of the United States. One of them, in my judgment, is manifestly unfit. That judgment is shared by people who worked with him in his cabinet and in the White House. He is manifestly unfit. I disagree with her on any number of issues. Issues that used to be the most important things in our politics. Now the most important thing in our politics is, do we share a commitment to the rule of law? Do we share a commitment to the peaceful transfer of power? Do we share the understanding that Character is the most important thing for anyone who bears that solemn trust and responsibility. You know, maybe when I was younger I got spoiled because I, I worked with a person who, whatever you thought of him, knew, everybody knew, he was sincere, he was decent, he was well motivated, and he had personal character. His name was Ronald Reagan. Biggest blessing of, my, of, of, of certainly my career to have a chance to work with him. But. I cannot support, in my conscience, I cannot support someone who is unworthy of that office and threatens all kinds of danger to the fundamental things on which this country was built. All right, coming up, a down ballot candidate says voter awareness is one of her biggest campaign obstacles. We find out how severe that problem is. Welcome back. Down ballot candidates tell us many voters don't even know about the races they're running in. News 8's government reporter Garrett Berquist found out just how serious the problem is. Candidates everywhere are going door to door as we enter the final stretch of this election cycle. Sometimes those door knocks turn educational. Hi, my name is Stephanie Yoakum and I'm out and about introducing myself. I'm actually running to be your next state representative. Yoakum says she's already done this about 4,000 times this election. So nice to meet you. Thank you for voting. She says as many as half of the people she talks to don't even know there's a state house race this year. And if they do know, they may still not know who their state rep is. And so that's the main reason I'm out here is to introduce myself. You know, a state rep, the goal is to represent your district. That shows up in voting returns. Political scientists say nationwide, up to 25% of voters who fill out ballots don't fill out the down ballot races. 
There's even a name for this phenomenon, roll off. Candidates across the ballot see it because when they look at the number of voters who actually voted in their races compared to the top of the ticket, they do see that sizable difference, not because they're in a smaller district, but also because a smaller percentage of people made a choice. Benyon says that's a problem because the down ballot races are just as important as those for the president and Congress. The state legislature determines whether you have access to things like abortion, guns, certain kinds of education, and also health care. Those are really important things that affect people's daily lives, and those are decisions made by the state legislature, not by the president of the U.S., and generally not by Congress. She says between now and Election Day, plan out when and where you will vote. Look up who is running in your area and research them. I think the most important thing is that their voice really does matter. Um, last session, there were races that were within 200 votes. Uh, and so every single person coming out, their vote really matters, especially in the down ballot races where the districts are so much smaller than when you think about the entirety of the United States. Yoakum says the act of researching and talking to candidates is as important as voting itself. I've knocked on doors and, and ended up in a conversation with folks who have said that they probably won't vote for me because I'm not on the, the party ticket that they typically vote for, but we still end up having really positive conversations. You have until October 7th to register to vote. We've made it easy for you to both check your voter registration and see who is on your ballot. Take out your phone and scan the QR code on your screen. That will take you to the As Seen On section of our website. I have included a link to the Secretary of State's voter information portal in the article for this story. In Fishers, I'm Garrett Bergquist for Wish TV. WishTV.com or follow us on Facebook for updates. All right, coming up, Indiana's best political team on Harris's endorsements and a new lawsuit over IU's campus expression policy. And welcome back to All Indiana Politics as we welcome in two members of Indiana's best political team, Republican Mario Masolomini and Democrat Ariel Brandy. Good to see you both. Let's begin with that interview we heard at the beginning of this show with Peter Rustovan. Mario, we'll start with you here. Some Republicans broke with Trump, as you know, four years ago as well. Are we looking at a repeat of 2020? So in full disclosure, uh, you know, I, I've worked with Peter Rustovan at, at Barnes and Thornburg. Great guy, great attorney. The problem for, uh, that I have is, you know, Peter is one of the uh, half of one percenters, right? So he doesn't understand that the plight of the American people, that they are having a hard time uh, paying their bills. They can't put food on their tables. They can't make their car payment. Peter doesn't have that problem. But many people are resonating with Donald Trump, especially the lower and the middle class people, because this Biden-Harris economy is killing the American dream. People are not able to uh, afford things. You know, cost of living has gone up. People can't afford to buy their first houses. They're living with their parents still. You know, I, I do criminal defense law. Uh, we have so many people coming in uh, to our office talking about the fact that they can't pay their bills. They're struggling. They're barely living paycheck to paycheck. And that's the last four years of the Kamala uh, Biden administration. And we need Donald Trump because, you know, if passed as a prologue, you know, we saw what Donald Trump did in four years. The economy was booming, people had money, people were spending that money, and people's lives were better. The economy was so much better, and we had no issues really in foreign policy. Right now, we're helping out with two different wars, one in the Middle East, uh, one in Ukraine. That, that, that wasn't occurring during Donald Trump's administration. And the Kamala Biden administration, if she gets reelected, will be another four years that this uh, American public cannot uh, and survive through. Ariel, I'll let you respond to all of that. Also, how well do voters, uh, from a political standpoint, respond to cross-party endorsements like these? I mean, I don't think that people aren't necessarily always paying attention to these cross-party endorsements. I think at this point, you know, we've dealt so much in the political system of voting for the lesser of two evils. I think at this point, when we're looking at the American people, yes, we're looking at how bad they're struggling, the economy, all of those things. But at the end of the day, it is basic decency, how we're talking to each other when we're on the public stage, especially in national politics and how we're upholding the law and democracy. We've seen that blatant disrespect from Donald Trump and how he has acted towards Vice President Kamala Harris during this race. And I think that's something that turns people completely off from politics. They wanna see something different. Um, you know, our, the guests talked about accepting the results of the election, plain and simple. 
you know, the passing of power. Those are things that people are looking at and want to be able to see. And we've seen that overthrown and not done from Donald Let Trump. Let me push back one second here. I mean, this is nothing new with with Donald Trump. I mean, this is we, we know this guy. We know what you're going to get, yep. right? This is not this is not new stuff here. This is who he is. Yeah, and I think people want to be able to see different. I think, you know, we have been able to see Republicans speak up and say he has not met the expectations of what I thought was supposed to be a leader at this level or what I thought that I was going to see in my party. Yeah. Um, even at the DNC, we were seeing Republicans come to the national convention talking about their experiences and why they chose to be alongside us in the national stage even on the ads talking about their experiences of being in the republican party and how donald trump is not the leader that they want to lead right. this country right. Bill, yeah Bill, go ahead go ahead quickly, really quickly Mara, and then we'll if you want to pick if you want to pick somebody that's mean then donald trump's not the person or that's not mean donald trump's not the person to pick right but what donald trump has proven in the last four years is that he made sure the gas prices were low, housing prices were low. Yeah. He made sure that we were drilling and we the well, drilling allowed for low fuel costs, which allowed for production of goods and services uh, to become cheaper, which allowed for the American economy to be more vibrant and thrive. Yeah, he was mean, but guess what? Uh, our foreign enemies never dared to threaten or to go against him because of the fact that he even told them, you dare to come after us, we'll come after you tenfold. Right. And so, yes, Donald Trump is mean, but this is not a mean or popularity contest. Right. This is on who's well, going to we'll, get the job done, yeah. and Donald Trump's that person. We, well, we'll see what happens on Election Day there. Hey, Indiana University's new campus free expression policy uh, now faces a lawsuit from the ACLU. This comes as faculty there demanding protections from the state's intellectual diversity law. Ariel, uh, you first on this. University officials say the law does not prevent researching or teaching about diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, or even related topics. So. Are the faculty fears kind of overblown here? No, I don't think so. I mean, we're seeing even in our own state legislature, the censoring, the book banning, the not wanting to talk about certain subjects in the classroom. I mean, we should have known it was going to trickle into higher education, too, at this point, if it's also coming from the Supreme Court and how we were, you know, overturning the fact that, you know, affirmative action isn't something that we can have anymore in this country. So I don't think they're overreacting. I think what we're running into is a complete infringement on the First Amendment right of being able to have free speech. If you're a student and you can't even walk on campus between the hours of, what is it, 11 p.m. and 6 a.m. Yeah. with a t-shirt that says something that you're aligned with or organizing on campus, organizing is the backbone of this country. Right. It is how so many of these movements have been built for the democracy that we have today. So restricting students in an environment where they should be learning, exercising those rights and being able to do so, it's restrictive. 1 p.m. does um, seem kind of early, especially for yeah. uh, for college students. Hey, Mario, I'll let you weigh in as well. Also, will the lawsuit hold up in court? Keep in mind, I want to get to one more question. I have about a minute and a half left. I don't I don't think the lawsuit's going to hold up in court. I, you know, here's the thing. There's got to be a fine balance between the freedom of speech and the uh, freedom of education right? Uh, the school is trying to allow for their, these kids who have paid uh, good money to be educated. We saw from the last protests uh, approximately a year ago how they were basically shutting down the school and protests were causing for kids to be in schools and classrooms to be disrupted. So, you know, IU is trying to find a, a fine balance between allowing people to have freedom of speech, but also the freedom of education to allow for people to be educated in their public schools. And so that, I believe, is yeah. a tough, tough job. And, and and they're trying to do the best they can. And I think that there are going to be some snags until they find a policy that fits and uh, accomplishes both. We'll see what happens with that. Indianapolis Mayor, guys, Joe Hogg said finally answering questions. I have 30 seconds left. Want to get your take on everything that happened uh, with that situation over the week. Ariel, 15 seconds to you. Go ahead. Yeah, not uh, not answering questions enough for me. I mean, yeah. we're seeing some policies being implemented, but it's not enough, Joe. We got to do more, okay. and we have to be able to answer what these women are asking for and the demands. Ariel, and it seems like you agree. You're shaking your head the, in agreement. The, you know, Ariel and I agree, and that's how we're going <laughs> to uh, continue on this Labor Day weekend because this is 2024. These women should not go through the type of harassment that they went through. Yeah. There should be policies and procedures in place. Uh, Indianapolis yeah. is the largest right. city in the state of Indiana. We need to do a better job. Right. Joe Hodgson needs well, to do a better We will leave it right job. there, guys. Have a good Labor Day. We will talk to you soon. Thank you very much. We will be right back. All right. Thank you for joining us for All Indiana Politics this week. We'll be back here next Sunday, of course, at 930 in the morning. And be sure to tune in at 11 o'clock for The Hills Sunday with Chris Steyerwald. Have a great 
rest of your weekend.